Well, should we have a look at this Audison then? Ah, right, yes, I think we've bloody well should do. This is an Audison SR4, and um, I think apparently, according to the customer, this one went boom, big time. This one properly popped. He says, my mate works in car audio security, has done like eight years, and he's never seen anything like it. So get ready with the fire extinguishers, because they don't half go bang. I've no idea if that's what he sounds like, but that's what I've decided he sounds like for today. So that's what we're doing. Audison SR4. I smell them. Doesn't stank. Ah, oh, gotta get a wood. So it's unlikely to be a power supply failure. Now, when an amplifier goes bang with a loud, sharp crack, that is high voltage uh, arcing to ground or arcing to a much lower potential. And um, that will usually be an output section failure because in the power supply, we're just dealing with low voltage, high current. So when the power supply section fails, you don't really get much of a pop in audible terms. You might get like a poof, like a softer poof. And then you get a load of smoke, massive amounts of heat and current draw. Whereas with the output section fault, you'll get a instantaneous loud sharp, um, maybe multiple of them if the power supply doesn't shut down instantly. Um, and then, but, but then the amplifier should realize something is going horribly wrong and turn the power supply off. And um, yeah, that's usually, usually it. So, um, so I'm thinking we've got output section failure in here somewhere. Uh, now this is upside down in the case, or well actually it's the correct way round really. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're looking at the bottom of the PCB here. So I don't instantly see like any blown open traces or anything on the back here. So let's get this thing out of the heat sink and have a look at the top. I suspect it lost um, output transistors and the high voltage rail just sort of like shorted out to ground. Or Actually, no, here we go. There's our, there's our source of our audible explosion. There we go. So this transistor, the case has popped off it. Bang, massive pop there. Is actually a MOSFET. So this is a class AB amplifier, but it has MOSFET final, um, which makes them a little bit more efficient and they can do much higher power um, than regular BJT in the output section. So just quickly then, this is obviously gonna be outputs of some kind. And then we have our rectifiers here. These transistors are going to be generating the auxiliary voltage supplies for the, um, the drive circuits or the preamplifier plus minus 15 volts probably and over here actually no you know what i'm mistaken these are not outputs i do apologize these <laughs> it, it's been a long day these are the power supply mosfets which is interesting because the way that this power supply mosfet has failed is more like an output fed it's not burned slow cooked it's gone bang straight away and um there isn't really any like cooking or like high heat or anything on there it's probably just blown the fuse this over here these are the outputs and these are in fact bjt's these are trans transistors um what am i talking about this is getting out of the freaking case first before you start trying to analyze what you can see and what you can't see Okay, nice and easy this one comes out. So, honestly, I'm not seeing the intensity, like the way that this guy described it, it sounded like some freaking at atomic bomb had gone off, but uh, really this just doesn't look bad at all from a visual perspective. Um, yes, we have a popped power supply fit over here. Very, very undramatic as far as power supply MOSFETs go. Now, why do we have a popped power supply MOSFET? Let's take a look at the output transistors over here. Are any of them shorted and has it overloaded the power supply? So we take a multimeter continuity mode, just gonna go ahead and go between all three legs of the output transistors to see whether there is a short over on the output section on any of these. I'm taking a quick glance at the multimeter, looking for sort of like low readings, anything under 100 ohms, for example. But these are all looking fine, very interesting. So I wonder why the power supply has decided to fail by itself. Do we have any shorts on the rectifiers? These rectifiers, just any rectifiers, in fact, in car amplifiers, are extremely rare to die, very rare. You barely ever, ever kill a rectifier. But over the last couple of uh, weeks, I think I've had like two amplifiers with dead rectifiers. So it's becoming a bit of a trend. So I'm just gonna double check. No, that's fine, that's fine. Okay, no problem. So, could just be a basic, simple power supply repair on our hands. Very strange. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and replace all of the, well, it's only got four power supply fares, a very low power amplifier here. So let's go ahead and cut these off. And with them cut off, we're going to apply some power to the amplifier. Just make sure that both banks of these power supply fares are actually getting driven, as if they're not both getting driven, that could be why they have popped, if there's like a drive circuit fault with the power supply, which again, is pretty rare, but yeah, there's gotta be some reason that these died, isn't there? Okay, power wires are in. Let's take our oscilloscope probe and turn on our power supply. 
We have no current draw there at all without the remote connected. That's good. Got up to 12 volts to start with. We have no FETs in, so it's fine. And let's probe the power supply MOSFET gate. And because these MOSFETs are mounted backwards to the case, I had to take a moment there because I looked at pin one and I was like, eh, that's a ground trace. What? Why is gate on ground? But then I realized it's backwards because they're backwards. So, okay, we get absolutely nothing on the gate. And I've just realized that is because the fuse has gone pop which is actually why the power supply MOSFET failure doesn't look very dramatic because the fuse has popped. This is exactly, this is perfect. This is exactly what the fuse is supposed to do. It's supposed to protect a potential fire hazard from happening inside the amplifier whereby you have shorted FETs just literally cooking up all day long. Now this is a 30 amp fuse. I don't have any fuses that are that small. I've got a bunch of these, what the heck? I've got a bunch of these fuses from the band of Viking amplifiers that are all like 150 amps. So um, yeah, I'm not going to be re replacing not going to be replacing that today. But just for the um, purposes of testing, because I have a current limited power supply at my disposal, we don't need a fuse in here just now because we are not connecting a high current power supply. So I can actually go ahead and just lay something across these to make a connection. I'm just going to be using some old solder wick here. There we go. I wonder how many amps that will take to blow. <laughs> So now if we turn the power supply on, we should get some PWM at the gates, provided the drive circuit is okay. Um, now because the uh, power was removed from the circuit very quickly by means of that fuse, I suspect that the power the drive circuit most likely survived. It is made up of these tiny little SOT23 package transistors, which are quite delicate though. They don't take long to die, but the fuse did blow seemingly pretty quickly as soon as that power supply FET went pop. So let's take a look, see what kind of PWM we have on here. Oh my god! Ooh, what the fuck? Uh, okay, I'm gonna give you the scope screen. Now I don't actually have another one of these amplifiers to use as a reference, okay? But in my six years of repairing car amplifiers now... Oh, that's better. No, that's better. It's, ch it's changed! It's, ch it's changing! So when I first powered this up on the scope, before the scope was big on your screen, the frequency was 800 kilohertz on the power supply MOSFET gate there. Now it's gone down to 118 kilohertz, which is still absolutely preposterously large. Um, <laughs> This is a very interesting failure. I've never seen this exact failure. I, I think I know what the failure is, but I haven't actually seen it ever occur. Um, damn, I wanna try and get it back up at 800. That was hilarious, that was so high. So let me try and explain here why that's a problem. Okay, this here is the power supply. We have a transformer. The transformer obviously is gonna be taking low voltage and stepping up to high voltage, but in order to step that voltage, in order to change 12 volts into something higher for the output section, it must be AC. The transformer only works with AC. It doesn't work with DC, it's just basically a short circuit as far as DC is concerned. So what happens is your 12 volts comes in from your vehicle power supply. It sits on these MOSFETs and these MOSFETs are like switches and they are controlled by a circuit over here which creates some pulses and it tells the MOSFET to turn on and off and on and off very, very quickly. Very, very quickly in fact. Usually for these power supply circuits it's around 25,000 times a second it turns that switch on and off. Hence why you can't use a mechanical switch because it would freaking explode and burn out. And Now it does this in two banks. You have the MOSFETs and they are sitting on the primaries of the transformer. And you have one bank that turns on and then the other bank turns on as the other one turns off. And it creates this kind of oscillation, like push-pull. And it builds some AC oscillation on the primaries of the transformer by these two banks turning on and off and on and off through the primary transformer wind. That then, of course, induces a current on the secondary wind at a much higher voltage because the secondary has more turns on it. So that's how it works. But each transformer will have a kind of optimum frequency that the AC needs to be in order for the transformer to work best, to work most efficiently. And if the frequency of AC that is on the primaries of the transformer is way outside of its operational range, then it won't work at all. It may actually present like a short circuit uh, environment to the MOSFETs that is driving it or whatever is driving the primaries. In car audio amplifiers, generally the switching power supplies are going to be switching 
around 20 to 50 kilohertz, like 99% of car amps, it's 20 to 30 kilohertz, like 25, 28, 26 kilohertz is what you'll find in car audio amplifier, power supply switching circuits. However, when we probe the gate on this one the first time, on my scope screen, I saw 880 something kilohertz, which is, as you can see, ridiculously high, absolutely astronomically high. And I can just tell you by looking at this transformer, it's not gonna work with that high of a frequency. Um, now when we turn it on, because uh, whatever component is failing is changing in value, so the frequency is changing, I got about 100 kilohertz. So you see I've got 118 kilohertz now, which is still ridiculously high for a car audio amplifiers power supply but it is a bit lower like the transformer would probably work to some extent here on this high frequency but i think it would probably draw a absolute crap ton of current just for clarification when these mosfets died they can sometimes damage the drive circuit however they can't physically damage the um origin of this pwm frequency where this originates from so this being a ridiculously high frequency is not as a result of the mosfets dying and damaging the circuit the reason that these mosfets died is because of this control circuit failure and the switching frequency going way too high but just before i fit new mosfets i actually before i do that i want to go and see whether i can influence the switching frequency of this um, circuit by touching the um, air the components around here which actually set that oscillation frequency because there's obviously some little capacitor or resistor or something that is dying over here and is um, causing the tl 494 to oscillate at such a high frequency so i want to see whether i can influence it by kind of heating it or touching it or doing some you know some stuff over here with it ah the switching frequency has changed once again we are up at 233 kilohertz now not quite as high as the 800 we saw earlier but that is still pretty high what about if i change the input voltage to the amplifier 14 volts still 200 i think that it will change i think that i think that heating it will change it so I'm just going to turn my uh, hot air gun on. I'm just going to go ahead and heat the uh, components over here, which are responsible for setting the, uh, the frequency and see whether they change while I heat it a little bit. Now, even if the circuit was totally normally functioning, heating the resistor and capacitor that sets this frequency would naturally always cause a shift in frequency. However, I'm looking for a dramatic jump in frequency from like 200 to 800, which would never happen. You might go up and down by like sort of 20, 30 kilohertz by heating and cooling these components around here. But I'm looking for a dramatic jump that signifies a failing component. Oh, wow. All of a sudden, literally, I just, literally, I just touched my it was like less than a second of hot air and the frequency has jumped down to 87 kilohertz do a little bit more now it's jumped down to 27 kilo see this is more like what it should be see this 27 kilos that's probably the correct value there now i wonder if i drastically cool if I cool down that circuit quite a lot, let's take some um, isopropyl alcohol. I don't have any free spray, but let's take some isopropyl alcohol and let's um, spray that on these components and blow on it to really, really cool it down. So that should be a lot colder now. Let's reapply the power. I'm a bit dizzy from blowing that. Um, so let's reapply the power and see whether the frequency has changed. So we were sitting at 27 kilohertz when it was warm from the hot air gun. Let's see what it's gonna be now. Damn, still 26 kilohertz as it was before. So maybe applying the hot air gun is just kind of like, maybe there's a bad solder joint and that solder is now touching and even after cooling it down quite considerably, it's not um, releasing, it's not kind of cracking apart like it was before. Um, shouldn't really do this, but let's just spray it with some ice isopropyl alcohol while it's on, it's all low voltage. So spraying with the isopropyl alcohol while it's on doesn't seem to be affecting it. Um, however, let's see what happens if we flex the PCB. If there is a bad solder connection, flexing the PCB will make that connection intermittent and maybe give us a shift in frequency here. Yes, look at that. Literally, as I bend the PCB, the frequency on the scope changes gets dramatically higher. It's actually really interesting. It's, it's very analog, almost. Like, the amount that I bend, the amount that I bend this is directly proportionate to the frequency. And if you can see my, my muscles there in my hand, as, as I bend it, the frequency goes up. As I release it, it goes down. Very, very cool. I have myself 
you know, if, if, if you connect to the speaker, though, or if, if, if us humans could hear that higher frequency, if you connect the little speaker to this, it would be going wee, wee. Wow, there, there we go. There's our, there's our, wait, let, let me zoom right in, right in the scope here. That's 490 kilohertz. I still can't get to the 800 that it was before. But yes, I am able to directly influence that by simply flexing the PCB here. So that is going to be a uh, cracked solder joint. Um, now, what I'm going to go ahead and do is I'm going to take my microscope and I want to see, can we actually see that crack? I mean, I did take a quick look with my eyes here. I can't visibly, physically see that cracked solder joint without zooming right on the scope. So I'm going to grab the microscope. We're going to see if we can actually see that crack through the scope, just out of pure interest. Okay, so we are zoomed right in to the TL494 chip, and this is the chip that is generating the oscillation pulses for the power supply FETs. However, it's not a fixed frequency. It can, you can change, you can set the frequency of this. I, from, if my memory serves me right, uh, it's a combination of a capacitor and a resistor across pins five and six of this. So, let's go ahead and look. There's pin one, two, three, four, five and six. So there's a little via there for pin six and pin five there goes to this capacitor. So let's have a look at this capacitor and let's look at these solder connections on here. Ah, now that doesn't look too good, does it? I don't know, I don't know about you, but that looks pretty cracked to me. If we take a, now I'm just gonna flex the board ever so slightly. Yeah, that solder joint looks pretty cracked to me. So what will be happening is that that solder joint will either be going almost open or incredibly high resistance, which will be basically changing the uh, capacitive load on pins across across pins five and six, which will be changing the oscillation frequency of this chip. So that's the capacitor. The resistor, I can't quite, it goes through a via here, so maybe it comes out, uh, maybe it's this one here. Is 223 perhaps? Um, you can see there's cracked solder flux around there, and actually that, that doesn't look that well soldered on the top there either. So, I mean, it doesn't look as bad as the capacitor, but it's not great. And just out of interest, let's take a look at some of the solder connections on the rest of the resistors around here. Um, like, this is one of the things that I don't really like about surface mount. So, surface mount is great because it massively saves space. It, it horrendously cheapens up the um, manufacturing costs of uh, circuits and um, amplifiers and stuff like that. But and I guarantee, I guarantee it is the lead-free solder that is kind of partly um, responsible for this. Like the, the the joints, so many times, so many amplifiers that I get in are damaged as a result of poor solder joints on the surface mount components or cracking over time, things like that, which could be completely avoided by either using through-hole components, which is one of the reasons, not the sole reason, but it's one of the contributing factors to why old equipment tends to last forever. Oh, they don't make them like they used to. Kind of, they don't. They kind of don't. I mean, there is lots and lots of factors at play here. Um, some planned negligence, negligence, obsolescence. I'm sure, but um, and the ever increasing drive to zero. You know, trying to get this thing banged out as cheap as possible. But there is a lot to say for the older equipment using simpler circuits and larger components that just have more solder and they have lead in the solder which is just much better they do last longer because they don't suffer from these kinds of issues here like most of these are looking fine but um just it doesn't look great so what i'm actually going to go ahead and do i mean there is a an absolute sea of surface mount components on this board for me to sit down and go through every single surface mount component and reflow it with leaded solder is going to take me absolutely ages so but what i am going to do is i'm going to go ahead and reflow with fresh solder and good flux any of the surface mount components that i can see that don't look that great uh, specifically around the power supply oscillation um, pwm generation circuit over here i mean there, there's there's hundreds of resistors and capacitors all over this board and i would love to go through and reflow all of them but the labor charges for that wouldn't really be worth it considering that 99 percent of them are probably going to be absolutely fine for many 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 years to come it would just be a great preventative measure 
but I am going to go ahead and reflow the ones around this area that don't seem too great. And yeah, that should be all this amplifier needs. Their output section won't have had anything to do with this failure. This failure won't have affected the output section in any way. All that's happened is that frequency, that switching frequency has jumped way too high, which caused the MOSFETs to see a short circuit environment on the power supply transformer because that transformer doesn't work at that high frequency. It just basically is a short. And the actual drive buffers, the transistors themselves seem to be okay because we're getting a nice, clean, good square wave on the scope screen there. So yeah, literally the frequency went high, that FET went poof, this fuse blew, and that's gonna be literally it, I think. So we want some fresh flux on all of these components around here. Then we want some nice 4060 on the tip of our iron. And then we just drop that onto each of the components. And the flux being there will transfer our fresh 4060 to the solder joint. Now take some isopropyl alcohol and clean off the uh, flux there that we've just added. And that now looks a million times better. Now the fresh power supply fits are fitted, so we can, without further ado, go ahead and power this thing up, make sure that the switching frequency is correct. I believe the 27 kilohertz was the correct frequency, which we saw after we applied the heat gun for the first time. And when we bent the board up into the kind of upright position, that's, that's the full connection to that capacitor. And I'm sure it will be, but we just want to make sure the output section is okay as well. Now, because it's a class AB amplifier, we don't really want to be powering this up and leaving it powered up for too long out of the heat sink because the output transistors will warm up and without proper heat sinking, without the circuit being able to detect the, the kind of temperature of the output transistors, we could go into kind of thermal and current runaway on the output section. So we just want to kind of power it up for a few seconds, make sure everything's okay, then get it back in the heat sink. So let's probe the back of the power supply MOSFETs and power it up, see what we have. Interesting. Now we don't actually have any switching on the FETs whatsoever. That was a little unexpected. Okay, why do we not have switching? Let's probe the gates of these MOSFETs and see what we have on the scope screen. Oh. We have a little sawtooth wave. Hello little sawtooth wave. What are you doing there? You are present on every single one of these gates and you are at 670 kilohertz. Eh? So perhaps the issue wasn't that capacitor that we saw, even though it looked like it was cracked. Let me go ahead and uh, flex the board a little bit, probe the low side drain, probe the drain of this power supply MOSFET and flex the board a little bit and just see whether we get anything on the MOSFET as we're powering it up. We've got very, very low current going in here. One amp is all we're allowing into this board right now, so we're perfectly safe. Okay, that's not changing it at all. So maybe the component, the capacitor, the resistor is actually going way out of tolerance and dying and reflowing it with the soldering iron has kind of shifted its value like indefinitely now. Let me, let me probe the gate and let me just see if flexing the board makes any change to the uh, little sawtooth on there. Doesn't, does it? So the output of the TL494 is pins 9 and 10, which should be over here. So yeah, we've got 680 kilohertz um, output PWM from the TL494. Let's just confirm for a minute exactly which one of these resistors is the one that sets the uh, the frequency. So we've got pin one, two, three, four, five. So pin five goes to this capacitor. Then on the other side of this capacitor, we should have a resistor, two, two, three. We also have this two, two, two. And then whichever one of these other resistors has continuity to pin six, one, two, three, four, five, six, is the one that sets the frequency. Yes, okay, it's this one here, this 222. And that is a 2200 ohm resistor. So these two components here are what sets the oscillation frequency of the TL494. So either the capacitor's bad, the resistor's bad, or the TL494 itself is bad. So let's just check the resistance of this 2200 ohm resistor. That is within tolerance 217, so it's probably going to be the capacitor that's the issue here. Or perhaps the TL494 itself. 
So what I've got here is a spare power supply drive card that I've got in my spares stash. And it just so happens to have the same kind of PWM generation circuit on it as our Audison. We've got a TL494 here, and the TL494, the oscillation frequency, will be dictated by one of these capacitors and resistors over here. Now when I initially kind of peeked down at this driver card, I thought it was exactly the same resistor values and stuff as our Audison, but our Audison is a 222, which is a 2200 ohm resistor, whereas this one seems to be 220. O2, so I, I slightly different, but so we got this little circuit here from pin five through this capacitor through this resistor to pin six. So if we turn this on now, let's probe what is the oscillation frequency of this whole setup. We're gonna probe pin nine of the TL494, and if we take a look on our scope screen, we can see that this has an oscillation frequency of 27 kilohertz, which is pretty much about what we want. But yeah, so what we can go ahead and do is steal the capacitor and maybe resistor from this circuit and drop it into our Audison. Now our Audison does have a different value resistor here. Our Audison has a 222 and this has a 220 to. So it could be that this capacitor value is calibrated to 27 kilohertz based on this resistor value, whereas the capacitor in our Audison will be at maybe a different value in order to work correctly with the with the 2200 ohm resistor to calibrate it to about 27 kilohertz. So out of interest, let's first of all, because the most likely component to fail is probably going to be the capacitor. We've already measured the resistor, which does check out at 2200 ohms. So if we go ahead and change out the capacitor first we can see what the resulting switching frequency comes out at with the uh, new capacitor from this spare board so that's the original capacitor from our Audison and let's drop in our donor replacement now we do need to wait for that to cool down a bit because with that high temperature it will change the value of that capacitor a little bit so just to kind of speed things up a bit blow on it a little bit of isopropyl alcohol so I've also disconnected the power supply MOSFET gates just very quickly there and jumped over from gate to source so that they don't magically turn on and get damaged without a proper gate connection. So let's go ahead with that capacitor from our donor board. Let's see what the switching frequency comes out at. 186 kilohertz so it's much slower than it was with that other capacitor but it's still way too fast so yeah like I said I think that's probably because the capacitor that was originally used in this board was a different value to complement this 2200 ohm resistor so what we can go ahead and do very easily is just take the um, resistor from this board the higher value resistor from this board and swap that out in place of the 2200 and that should give us our 27 kilohertz if that doesn't work if the frequency is still too high then that just means that the TL494 itself is dead and we can just swap that out as well for a brand new one that I've got in stock okay so with that swapped over let's see if it's now the same frequency as our donor board that's much bigger. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are at 26 kilohertz now, which is definitely much more like what this amplifier is supposed to be. And the fact that we saw, there's a couple of reasons why I believe that 26, 27 kilohertz is the correct value for this amplifier. Firstly, that is the frequency that we saw when we first applied a tiny amount of heat to that area of the PCB um, when it first came in and was first playing up. Um, that's the frequency that we saw it jump down to as the lowest value. So I suspect that was probably the correct one. When we zoomed in on the microscope and we saw there was what looked like cracked solder. I suspect that it might have actually been um, not just the solder that was cracked but also the electrical contact on the capacitor to the capacitive material inside that ceramic capacitor. So reflowing that solder connection may not have fixed it, it may have looked much better from the outside but the actual issue on that side of the ceramic capacitor inside just, just behind that contact point was actually still bad and by touching the soldering iron on it has moved it and shifted it to now a point where it's not no longer touching or making any contact at all so that capacitor unfortunately I did want to read it on my tester but unfortunately as I took it out with the tweezers I dropped it on some well, I thought I dropped it on my lap here but I can't see it anywhere um, but I did want to put it in the tester and just see what value it was or if it was reading anything because that would have been interesting but I don't think I'm gonna find that now so let's put the rest of our power supply back together then reconnect these gate resistors and remove our jumpers from gates to source to re-enable the whole power supply and uh, yeah find the amplifier should come alive okay cool let's do this then show me some freaking switching 
Hey, that's what I want to see. Nice big square wave there on the MOSFET drain on the power supply. I suspect we do have audio. We have rail voltage, literally plus minus 22 volts worth of rails on this. It's a tiny little amplifier, just fuck all power. But um, I imagine it probably sounds all right. I don't know. I mean, all of a sudden it's supposed to be decent, but um, you know, without all the test equipment for THD and stuff like that, wouldn't really know. So there you go, that's a wrap. Power supply section failure and probably one of the rarest uh, failure modes that I have seen in a long time. Um, power supplies don't generally die on their own and this didn't die on its own. Um, bad solder or bad contact, bad capacitor caused the switching frequency to completely go all over the place and be completely wrong for this transformer and that killed the power supply FETs in turn. Quite a simple repair but something a little out of the ordinary. So I hope you enjoyed that. If you like these new sort of shorter formats, these videos, then uh, yeah, give it a thumbs up and let me know if you like this or not, or whether you prefer the old live streams that were hours and hours long. Uh, I'll try and do some more live streams soon, but um, I do have so much work to get through. These are just much quicker to do and to, you know, to make. So thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next one.